guys and uh, welcome to week two of our work on simple harmonic motion. If you recall last week we were looking at uh, any system that undergoes simple harmonic motion is one where you have something that is disturbed from a rest position. We have the definition of simple harmonic motion being in terms of as you move something from the rest position it experiences a restoring force that is proportional to the displacement from the rest position and opposite in direction. <clears throat> we left it with this uh, example question where we had a mass between two springs and we went through that. So what we want to do today is just go on a little bit further and look at this in terms of the uh, velocity and acceleration and the energy in the system. Um, uh, it's quite short. We haven't got much in the way of new theory, once you've got the definition, hopefully it's a bit easier. So we've got a couple of past paper type questions to have a look at afterwards. So without further ado, let's have a go. Let's have a look at velocity first of all. So it is possible to derive um, a relationship for velocity for any system undergoing simple harmonic motion. Uh, we start with our standard equation, y equals a sine omega t. Now, sine omega t is equal to y over a. If we square both sides, then we can get sine squared omega t equals y squared over a squared. Then if we look at velocity as being the rate of change of displacement, so that's dy by dt, then uh, that is equal to a omega cos omega t. So that's our derivative of uh, a sine omega t. Um, we can do a similar kind of thing. We can derive cos omega t, sorry, divide both sides by a omega. So that's cos omega t equals v over a omega. Uh, again, we can square both sides. So cos squared omega t equals v squared divided by a squared omega squared. That's our second relationship. And then from trigonometry, uh, sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals one. So we've got two relationships above for sine squared and cos squared omega t. So if we add those together, uh, we can say that, well, I'm not going to read it out. You can see, but adding the two together is equal to one. And that's taking our relationship for sine squared, which is here and our relationship for cos squared, which is here, and adding them together. A little bit of rearrangement, which we'll not go through. We come up with our final rearrangement here, which is velocity equals plus or minus omega multiplied by the square root of a squared minus y squared. So just a reminder what these all are. Mega is our angular velocity or angular frequency. A squared is our amplitude and y sorry, A is our amplitude and Y is our displacement from the rest position. So why have we got this plus or minus term here? Well, we are working in one dimension. So we've got this sign convention that usually to the right is positive and to the left is negative. Because we're squaring Y here, we're losing that direction information. So we're losing the positive and negative. So we get a magnitude for the velocity, but it could be in either direction. Uh, so we have to remember that when we're working with the velocity equation here. Um, looking at it, well, um, if the amplitude is the maximum y displacement, then we maybe perhaps look at the displacement where y is equal to a. Um, then a minus a is 0. And the velocity is plus or minus omega times zero. So the velocity is zero. So at the, the largest displacements, we know that the velocity uh, passes through zero. Um, what about if it's in the equilibrium position? Well, that's the case where y is equal to zero. So a minus zero, a squared minus zero. So our velocity at the equilibrium position where we'd expect velocity to be at its largest is plus or minus omega a which is exactly what we see here. Oops. So at the extremities, y equals a and velocity equals zero. And at the midpoint, y equals zero. And the maximum velocity that the object has at any point in its cycle is omega a, plus or minus, of course, because it could be in either direction. Okay. Um, 
Let's have a look at an example. A mass is undergoing simple harmonic motion with an amplitude of 25 centimetres and angular frequency 4.2 radians per second. So we need to determine the speed of the mass, A, or part I, at the extremities of its motion, at the midpoint, at its equilibrium position, and halfway between midpoint and maximum amplitude. And then we need to determine the acceleration of the same example. So looking at AI, first of all, determine the speed of the mass at the extremities of the motion. Well, determines a lovely word at advanced higher. It doesn't tell you anything about how much work you've got to do. And of course, in this, we were not allocating marks, but this would be a one mark question. No mass involved at the extremities of velocity is equal to zero. At the equilibrium position, um, we have this relationship here, V equals plus or minus omega A. So we're ignoring the, the direction of the velocity. We just want the magnitude here. Um, and that is 1.05 meters per second. Um, and then halfway between the midpoint and its maximum, well, we've got to work a little bit harder here. We've got to use the full formula. We can't just simplify it to V equals omega A. Um, plugging in the numbers gives us... 0.91 meters per second, plus or minus. Um, in terms of the acceleration, well, we know from last week that A equals omega squared Y or minus omega squared Y. So each of these um, positions, we have the angular frequency, which is the, the 4.2, and we can just plug in the numbers to get the results. Now, at the extremities of its motion, we expect maximal acceleration. So Let's double check, 4.41 meters per second squared, yep. Yeah. At the midpoint, well, at the, at the midpoint, the forces, the unbalanced force on the object is equal to zero. So we have no acceleration, that's fine. And then um, we have a point in between the two extremes where the value lies between the zero and the 4.41 meters per second. Excellent. Um, energy. Um, we need to look at energy, so we're going to look at kinetic energy. So if we look at the mass at any point in its journey, if we know its velocity v, we can get its kinetic energy half mv squared. Um, so, well, we've got a relationship for v, haven't we? So we can plug that uh, for v in, so it's v squared. So we get rid of any kind of square root signs, so it's omega squared a squared minus y squared, and that will give us your kinetic energy at any point within that journey. Now, we need to remember that if we have a spring, a system like a mass vibrating on a spring, the energy is constantly changing between kinetic energy and potential energy. So at the extremes of motion, we have lots of potential energy, but no kinetic energy. At the midway point, at the rest position, we have lots of kinetic energy, but no potential energy. So um, we can say um, that the total energy is equal to a half m omega squared a squared. So this is basically setting y to zero, the displacement to zero, and that gives us a total energy. Now, the total energy minus the kinetic energy at any point is therefore the potential energy. So if we take uh, that relationship, our total energy here is half m omega squared a squared. Um, that's the, the total amount of energy in the system. Then we can deduct the kinetic energy at a point in the oscillation. And after a little bit of simplification, we come up with a relationship for the potential energy as half m omega squared y squared. So these two relationships, um, you need to understand where they come from. Um, it's not one I've seen asked for a derivation. Um, I don't think you have to be able to know you don't. So you, these will be on your relationship sheet. So you just have to be able to use them. Okay. So let's have a look at an example. A piston and car engine has a mass of two kilograms and can be suited to move with simple harmonic motion. The amplitude of its motion is six centimetres when the car is idling. The piston has an angular frequency of 125 radians per second. OK, calculate the maximum kinetic energy of the piston, the maximum acceleration of the piston. Let's have a look at kinetic energy first. Um, 
Well, the total energy is half omega m omega squared a squared. We've got all the, the numbers in the question, and it's a case of plugging them in. So we've got a half, the mass of the piston, the um, angular velocity or angular frequency, and we've got the amplitude as well, which gives us 56 joules of energy. Now, to get uh, the maximum acceleration of the piston, well, we can use our familiar acceleration um, formula or relationship. So we've got the angular velocity again in the question, and we've got the displacement in the question, which gives us a fairly beefy 940 meters per second squared. The last bit of new knowledge we really need to look at is really quite straightforward, is the effect of damping. As always in physics, um, we've ignored friction and drag up until this point because they would have just muddied our understanding of simple harmonic motion. Um, so we need to look at what would happen in the real world if you had some frictional effects taking place. So we've got a graph here um, with uh, a couple of different lines on. So I think the first one we want to look at is the orange line. So if you look going back at the orange line, it starts out with a large amplitude. And as you can see, as time goes on, the amplitude is decreasing as we lose energy from the system uh, due to friction and uh, damping, as I suppose we should refer to it in simple harmonic motion. Um, important to see that the amplitude is decreasing. Um, but you can see that the period of the oscillation remains approximately constant. So the period's largely constant, but the amplitude's decreasing. So that's light damping. If we have heavier damping, you can see that it's exactly the same. And this is the blue line. The amplitude just decreases more quickly. That's the only difference there. The final case you have to know about is what's called critical damping. Critical damping is where you basically don't have an oscillation, the displacement decreases to zero and remains there. A good example of a place where critical damping might be useful would be the shock absorbers on your car. Um, don't know if any of you have actually already started learning to drive yet, but if you could go out and push down on a car, a car sits on four springs, uh, the suspension and the car is just sitting on four springs. And if you didn't have a shock absorber, if you went over a bump, your car would start going up and down like this, boom, 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 and it start oscillating backwards and forwards up against the spring's rest position and undergoing some harmonic motion. The shock, shock absorber is there to introduce dampening. Uh, so when the car goes over a bump, um, it won't bounce about like that. It will just return to its rest position as quickly as possible. And you can actually see this yourself. You don't even need to drive. Um, if you just push down above the wheel in a car, you'll see the the spring will compress and then the car will very quickly just return to its rest position without oscillating heavily. Okay. Um, special cases we almost don't need to mention um, because we have relationships for the period for these two cases, which you'll see quite often. So on the left-hand side, we've got um, whoops, a mass on a spring uh, oscillating vertically, and you'll see there's a relationship there for the period. Over on the right-hand side, you'll see there is a relationship for a pendulum. So this is quite hard to see, but we've got a, a retort stand here, and we've got a mass just hanging from a piece of string, and that, just like the pendulum of clock, can swing backwards and forwards. And the period is given by this relationship here. You're not expected to know them. If you're asked a question on them, you'll be given the relationships. Um, and uh, maybe hopefully if we get back to do some practical work, we might look at perhaps doing the, the pendulum one. It's a very good way actually for measuring the value of G um, because we can actually graph this and get some good data from it. Okay. Let's have a look at a fairly hard looking past paper question. Um, it looks hard just because a lot of information on the screen, but we'll break it down. <clears throat> we've got a student who's investigating simple harmonic motion. So we've got um, in the, see, we've got a sensor, a motion sensor. Uh, you, a lot of you have probably not seen this before. I think anybody that had, Mr. Wilson, I think he might have used it when doing dynamics a little bit last year. Um, 
but basically the the motion sensor puts out ultrasound pulses or even audible pulses of sound which reflect off the the mass and bounce back and the computer can do a speed distance time calculation to tell the distance between the mass and the sensor that's all it is um, so what the student does first of all is he lifts the mass and then lets it go to start it oscillating up and down so the first question is the student plans to model the displacement y of the mass from its rest position using the equation y equals a sine omega t, where the symbols have the usual meaning. Explain why the student is incorrect. Okay, to tackle this one, you just have to ask yourself, well, what happens when the displacement is zero? So the rest position is where the, the mass just hangs normally. It hasn't started oscillating. It's just... The, the spring's a little bit extended because of the weight of the mass, um, but it isn't moving. And that would be the zero displacement. Well, is that where it starts at time equals zero? No, it doesn't. It starts at the extreme of its motion at time equals zero. So to put it into perspective, at t equals zero, sine omega t equals zero, which would mean that the displacement is zero. This is clearly not the case here. So he could have got around this by using the cosine version of this, y equals a cos omega t, and that would have given him um, a suitable relationship. Uh, Bi, the unbalanced force acting on the mass is given by the expression f equals minus omega squared y. Um, Hooke's law is given by f equals minus ky, where k is the spring constant. By comparing these expressions, show that the frequency of the oscillation it looks like the one below, which looks a little bit complicated. Well, hopefully you've spotted straight away that you've got two uh, relationships for the force. Um, so after you've taken a bit of a deep breath, you think, well, maybe I can equate them, and that's indeed exactly what you do. So uh, you've got your first equation and your second equation, which you equate, you immediately get rid of the, the minus signs then it's really just a little bit of algebra from here. Omega squared equals ky over my. Um, y obviously disappears, it cancels out. Then you can square root, omega equals k over m. But um, omega root also equals omega, uh, 2 pi f. So given that we don't have omega in the formula we're looking for here, we've clearly got to rid of it. But oh, we do have f, so we can link omega equals 2 pi f. Uh, plug it in, do a bit of rearrangement, and we hopefully end up with a correct answer. Uh, I think I mentioned this before, but please recall when doing show questions that you must come up with exactly the same answer as is in the question. Please make it identical. Um, and that's two marks. Uh, where were we? Part two. The student measures the mass to be 0 0.5 kilograms and the period of oscillation to be 0 0.8 seconds. Determine the value for the spring constant K. Okay, well, we've just actually derived this relationship and often show questions are used in these kinds of examples. So we're given a relationship that we can use, even if we didn't manage to show that in the previous part. We can plug in our numbers. Um, all of them are given in the question, and we should be coming out at 31 newtons per meter. Okay. Part three. The student plans to repeat the experiment using the same mass and a second spring, which has a spring constant twice the value of the original. Determine the expected period of oscillation of the mass. Okay, this one's a going to take a little bit more thought. Um, there's a couple of ways you could handle this. I would probably have expected most people to just uh, use the equation they've already been given. And this time, we can plug in two times the spring constant, which should give us a period of oscillation of 0 0.56 seconds. Okay. Now, that's one way. You could have also tackled it this way. I'm guessing probably nobody would have done had I set this as a homework, um, where you can say t equals 0 0.8 over the square root of 2. And I set it as a challenge for you to actually justify why that's the case. Um, I'm thinking none of you are going to find that particularly obvious straight away. 
Um, and maybe if you can actually tell me why that's the case, you maybe just get a, a wee pat on the back. Uh, hint would be to start um, looking at this equation here and thinking what happens when you double the string, spring constant. So there's a challenge for you. Okay, the student obtains graphs showing the variation of displacement with time, velocity, and acceleration. That's, sorry, so we're looking for, a, we've got a graph of displacement, graph of velocity, and a graph of acceleration, and how they vary with time. And it's simple, which one is which? Well, um, probably easier to start with looking at displacement. Well, displacement starts um, at the extreme of motion so it's initially displaced and there's only one of these has a positive initial starting value so this is going to be the displacement here um, it's not going to be this one because the spring wasn't pulled down to start with it was pushed up and its displacement was non-zero at the beginning so the middle one's definitely displacement um, <clears throat> what about velocity then well the velocity starts at zero so it can't be either of these two and the velocity starts at zero and it's accelerating in a negative direction so this one here is the velocity graph this one up then at the top by a process of elimination has to be acceleration um some of you might be wondering why this is not just a straight line down here um because normally you would think about dropping something under the influence of gravity having been a straight line graph with a, a gradient of minus 9.8 or a value of minus 9.8 for the acceleration well remember it's not just the weight it's also the tension in the spring that's acting on it so we still have this sinusoidal motion um, at the start of the motion we have an acceleration in the negative direction uh, which is determined by the the weight of the mass and also by the force from the spring pushing it downwards as it accelerates downwards, then the tension of the spring is dissipating. Um, so eventually at the equilibrium position, it's acceleration downwards is only due to its weight rather than any force from the spring. And we get this oscillating pattern again. Okay, let's have a look at another question. Uh, this one's from the 2016 past paper. State what is meant by simple harmonic motion. Okay, well, let's have a look at this one. This is not perhaps the definition I would have expected uh, you to go for um, or to be the main one. I'd be looking for a statement around how the restoring force is proportional to the displacement from the rest position and in the opposite direction, um, which is kind of what this one's getting at, F equals minus KY. And in fact, uh, F equals minus KY is probably what I'd expect from the... Uh, energy efficient student who's not wanting to overwork themselves um, probably better to say something like this but around about displacement so i probably have gone with uh force proportional to displacement and an opposite in an opposite direction okay part two the displacement of an os oscillating object can be described by the expression y equals a cos omega t where the symbols have their usual meaning, show that the expression is a solution to the equation, uh, d squared y by dt squared plus omega squared y equals zero. Um, maybe a little bit of a sharp and take a breath, but we've been given this equation here. So maybe well, we should start differentiating it and see what happens. Well, let's do that. So we've got y equals a cos omega t. So we differentiate it once. So dy by dt equals minus omega a sine omega t. Um, it's the second der derivative in the equation in the last question. So we uh, differentiate it again. So it's minus omega squared a cos omega t. Um, now, how you do this from here is up to you. You could actually just plug that straight into the equation. Um, or you could also say that this, the minus whoop, a cos omega t is equal to y. So we could say that the second derivative is minus omega squared y. Um, and if our equation is this, then minus this plus this is equal to zero. So we've, we've done what we've been asked whoop, to do. <coughs> and have we got any more? 
Okay, um, <clears throat> a mass of 1.5 kilograms is suspended from a spring of negligible mass as shown. Uh, the mass is displaced downwards, so it's the downwards displacement this time, of 0 0.04 metres from its equilibrium position. The mass is released and we get some oscillations with uh, a 10 second, or 10 oscillations in 12 seconds. And we can ignore frictional forces. Show that the angular frequency omega of the mass is 5.2 radians per second. <clears throat> well, first job then, oops, 2016, is we need to get the period. <clears throat> so we had 12 oscillations in 10 seconds, so 12 divided by 10. <clears throat> and then we uh, have the relationship omega equals 2 pi over t. I'm not so sure many of you would have done that straight away. I think what a lot of you would have done is gone to the relationship omega equals 2 pi f. All I've done here is kind of substitute that in in one go. And whichever way you do it, you're going to get 5.2 radians per second. I would have expected probably most of you to, to probably do it this way, and probably most students would. Um, but that's just life, I guess. Um, Calculate the maximum velocity of the mass. Well, we should hopefully be starting to get quite used to this. We can use our velocity equation straight off the relationship sheet, plus or minus, which we're not going to worry about necessarily because we're only looking to the magnitude of the velocity. Um, plug in the numbers um, and we get 0 0.21 meters per second. Um, determine the potential energy stored in the spring when the mass is at its maximum displacement. Well, this is another straightforward plug in the numbers one, isn't it? So we've, all we can really do wrong is not realise that this is the equation we need to do. Um, so we can do half m omega squared uh, y squared, take it through as 0 0.032 joules. Um, Now, I would say at this point, we have a couple of questions that are dependent on, have us, on us having calculated the angular velocity correct in the first one. Fortunately, in these kinds of situations, the SQA usually give us the value because they know you're going to need it in these two parts. Um, just a quick reminder that if you're in an exam condition and you are missing a value from a previous section that you need to plug into this one, you can actually just make it up. Just say, assume that the angular frequency equals, um, and you can still access the marks from these two points. Hopefully that shouldn't happen, but if it does, then keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, C, the system is now modified so that a damping force acts on the oscillating mass. Describe how the modification may be achieved. So any reasonable way of increasing the frictional forces acting on this would do. Uh, one way would be to put it in a viscous liquid. Um, in previous years, you may have seen advanced higher students doing their projects using water and vegetable oil and all these kinds of things to investigate how the damping would affect that. You could also just do this in air. You could maybe increase the surface area. You could maybe put a large disc on the bottom. Um, it's really up to you to come up with some suitable way, but increasing the surface area and a more viscous medium would probably be quite common. Um, using the axes below, sketch a graph showing for the modified system how displacement of the mass varies with time after release. Uh, numerical values are not required. So this is just a quick, simple one marker. Um, have we got a graph here? So amplitude of harmonic wave decreasing. So let's have a quick look at this here. So can we do it quickly? So he, dis he displaced it um, downwards initially, didn't he? Um, oh, I'm losing my drawing ability. Let's see. No, I don't want that. Oh dear. My laptop's giving me problems. It's not going to let me draw on the screen by the looks of it. No, I won't worry too much, but I can. Re that was the last slide we we're going to look at anyway. 
and it was just going to be repeating this graph but with um, displacement in a downwards direction okay um, that's it for this week hopefully covering simple harmonic motion over two weeks didn't make it excessively painful um, let me know how you're getting on with it because I was quite worried about how you would get on with this part of the course um, there's practice problems that have been set for you to have a go at and there is a homework this week any questions let me know and hopefully see you at the tutorial goodbye